Hi everyone, this video is on DC motors. A DC motor is a device that converts electrical energy in the form of current into mechanical energy. There are many types of motors that can convert electrical energy into mechanical energy. In this module, DC motors refer to motors that specifically uses a direct current supply. This means the current that flows through the motor only flows in one direction and this is usually supplied by using a battery. There are many components in a DC motor, as you can see by this diagram. So in this video, we'll go through every component and hopefully by the end of it, you will understand the role and function of every single component. Before we go through the DC motor, it's important to review the motor effect. The motor effect refers to when a current current conductor is placed inside a magnetic field and experiences a force due to the magnetic field. The magnitude of this force is given by the equation F equals to B I L sine theta. B is the magnetic field strength. I is the magnitude of current flowing through the conductor. L is the length of the conductor inside the magnetic field. And the angle theta here refers to the angle between the conductor and the direction of the magnetic field. The direction of this motor effect force can be easily determined using the right hand palm rule. The thumb is in the direction of the current, the four fingers are in the direction of the magnetic field, and the palm will be facing the direction of the force. If you apply the right hand palm rule on this example here, where the current is going away from us, and the magnetic field is going from the north pole to the south pole, you will find that the force of the motor effect will be acting downwards. Let's look at an example with numbers. Suppose we have a straight conductor that's 10 centimeter long, and this is placed inside a 0.0025 Tesla magnetic field, and the 10 ampere current flows to the conductor. We can easily substitute these three numbers into the motor effect equation, as well as the angle between the conductor and the magnetic field, in which case this is 90 degrees, as they are perpendicular. And this will give us a very small force of 2.5 times 10 to minus 4 newtons. If we use a right-hand palm rule, you will see that the force acting on this conductor will be into the page. Now, what happens if we take the same conductor, but we change the orientation such that the conductor becomes parallel to the magnetic field? Well, in this case, the angle theta in the equation becomes zero, and sine zero degrees will give you a value of zero. That means the force acting on the conductor also becomes zero newtons. So in simpler words, when the conductor is parallel to the magnetic field, there will be no motor effect force acting on it. Now, what happens if we have a wire that's wound into a rectangular shape such that it makes three sides, A, B, B, C, and C, D? What will be the force acting on side C, D? Well, hopefully you realize that the force acting on A, B, and C, D would be the same. If we use the equation and substitute the numbers for the magnetic field strength, the current, and the length of the conductor, we'll get the same magnitude of force as before that was acting on side AB. However, since conventional current flows from positive to negative terminal of the battery, that direction of current will be the opposite as it flows through AB versus when it goes from C to D. And since the direction of current is reversed, when you're using the right-hand palm rule to determine the direction of the force, the direction of the force will also be reversed. So in this case, the force acting on side CD of this wire will be out of the page. And this is where we'll begin discussing the concept of how a DC motor operates. The force acting on side AB is into the page, and the force acting on side CD is out of the page. And in this position, side BC has no force acting on it. Imagine if you're looking from the front of this wire setup. What you will see is a single plane of the coil. This is side A on the left, and this is side D on the right. If you're taking a front view, the force acting on side AB will be acting downwards, and the force acting on side CD will be acting upwards. These two forces will generate torque, and allow the single loop of wire to rotate in an anti-clockwise direction. So by producing motor effect forces on side AB and CD using electrical energy, which is current, 
we can produce torque and rotation of this loop of wire. Now, typically when you're constructing a simple DC motor setup like this one, we can add multiple loops of wire so that the number of turns increases. If we have more loops of wire inside the magnetic field, each loop of wire will be acted upon by its own magnetic force. Multiple turns of wire is referred to as the armature of the DC motor. The force acting on an armature is equal to the force acting on one individual turn of coil multiplied by the number of turns there are. So we can modify the original motor effect equation, which is only for one turn of coil, into F equals to N, where N is the number of turns, multiplied by the magnitude of the motor effect force acting on one single turn. We usually prefer more turns of coil in an armature so that the total force and the resultant torque is increased. An armature consists of 50 turns of square coils with side length of 15 centimeters, and this is placed inside a 0.0010 Tesla magnetic field. When the battery is turned on, a 5 ampere current flows through the coils. Determine the magnitude of force acting on side XY of the armature. So this is side XY, and the length of XY as labeled is 15 centimeters. The total force acting on the armature is equal to the number of turns multiplied the magnitude of force acting on a single turn of coil. So N is 50, B is 0 0.001 teslas times by the current, which is 5 amperes, times by the length of the conductor, which is XY, and that is 0 0.15 meters. This is then further multiplied by the angle theta. The theta angle here is the angle between the magnetic field and the conductor, which is perpendicular. So this is 90 degrees. And this gives me a value of 0 0.0375 newtons. Let's discuss torque in further detail. The magnitude of torque is given by the equation F times by D times by sine theta. Let's review what each variable stands for. F is the force applied to generate a torque and the rotational motion. D is the distance between the pivot point, and that is the point about which the coil is rotating, and the point where the force is being applied. So if the coil is rotating in the middle here, in the midpoint between A and D, the distance D is the distance between where the force is applied, so the, at the end of the coil, and the midpoint of A and D. The angle theta is the angle between the force vector and the lever arm. The lever arm here is the plane of the coil, so AD. When the coil is in the position shown, the angle theta here is 90 degrees. When we have a simple DC motor setup, we have two forces that work together to produce the same torque. We have a force vector acting on side AB that's going downwards, and we have a force vector acting on side CD going upwards. They are acting on opposite sides and in the opposite direction but both will produce an anti-clockwise direction rotation and the same direction of torque. So the total torque is actually given by two times by FD sine theta. As we have two forces that are identical in magnitude producing the same torque. The force acting on each side is further given by the equation BIL sine theta. And this is then times by D sine theta. It's important to notice that the two thetas here actually refer to different angles. The first theta in the motor effect equation refers to the angle between the conductor, that is AB or CD, and the direction of the magnetic field. In this case, this will be 90 degrees. The second theta refers to the direction of the force due to the motor effect and the plane of the coil or the armature. And when the coil is in this position shown, this is also 90 degrees. So we can simplify this equation into two times by B I L multiplied by D sine theta. I've chosen to leave the theta here as it is because the angle between the force vector and the armature will not always remain as 90 degrees as it changes throughout the rotation. We can rearrange this equation into the following form, two times by L times by d, times by b i sine theta. The expression 2 times by l times by d 
is actually the area of coils. The distance d in the equation is the distance between the midpoint of side AD or BC and the side of the coils. The length L is of course the length of AB or CD. If you multiply 2 times by L times by D, this gives you the area of the rectangle in red as shown. So we can say that the total torque acting on the armature or the coils is equal to A, B, I, sine theta. In your formula sheets, this is given by torque equals to N, I, A, B, sine theta. Remember that the number of turns of coil is important to consider as it affects the magnitude of the total force that's acting on the coil to produce the torque. This is why we also include the variable N in the calculation of torque acting on the armature. As the armature rotates anti-clockwise due to the torque, the angle between the force vectors acting on side AB and CD and the direction of the magnetic field will change. When the armature is horizontal, it will make a 90 degree angle. As it continues to rotate, this angle becomes greater than 90 degrees. So since the angle theta changes with rotation, the magnitude of torque also changes with rotation. It's important to understand that in the beginning, when the armature is horizontal, when the angle theta is 90 degrees, this is when sine theta gives you the maximum value. And as a result, this is also when the torque acting on the armature is also the greatest. When the armature continues to rotate from the horizontal position, the torque will decrease from its maximum value. And when the armature reaches vertical orientation, the torque acting on the armature becomes zero. However, the armature will continue to rotate with momentum. A DC motor contains an armature of 100 turns of coil. Each coil has a dimension of 2 cm times by 20 cm as shown. The strength of the magnetic field is 0.005 teslas and the current of 8 amperes flows through the coils. Calculate the magnitude of the torque acting on the armature when it is parallel to the magnetic field. When the armature is parallel to the magnetic field, this is what's in the horizontal position that we saw before. So torque is given by N I A B sine theta. N is 100 times by I, which is 8 amperes, times by the area of this rectangular coil or armature, which is 0.1 times by 0.2 meters, times by the strength of the magnetic field, which is 0.005 teslas. And then this is times by sine 90 degrees. This gives me a total torque of 0.08 newton meter. Now, what about the magnitude of torque when the plane of the armature reaches the position shown here, when the angle between the horizontal and the plane of the armature becomes 30 degrees? Well, in this case, if the armature is rotating anti-clockwise, the direction of force on the left side will be acting downwards, and the direction of force acting on the right side will be acting upwards. What we need to find is the angle between the force vector and the plane of the armature. If we draw a horizontal line here and here, we will know that this angle here is also 30 degrees. So this whole angle is 30 degrees plus 90 degrees as this angle is perpendicular. So the angle theta between the force vector and the armature is 30 degrees plus 90 degrees and that's 120 degrees. So the torque is N I A B sine theta, the number of turns and the current and the area remains the same as the previous question, but the angle theta here is now 120 degrees rather than 90 degrees. And this gives me an approximate total torque magnitude of 0 0.069 newton meter. Let's look at what happens to the rotation of the armature when it gets to the vertical position and after it goes past the vertical position. As we discussed earlier, when the armature is in a vertical orientation, there will be no torque acting on the armature as the two forces are parallel to the plane of the armature. But the armature will continue to rotate due to its previous rotation and result in momentum. However, once the armature goes past this vertical orientation, we will have a problem. And the problem is that the force acting on side CD and side AB 
will remain in the same direction as before. Specifically, the force acting on side CD will still go upwards because the current direction is still going from C to D and the direction of the magnetic field has not changed. Similarly, the force acting on side AB is still acting downwards because the current direction flowing through AB is still from A to B. This is a problem because these two force vectors will actually cause the armature to rotate in a clockwise direction. This clockwise direction is the opposite to our previous rotation, which was anti-clockwise. So the force vectors that you see here do not allow for rotation in the same direction. If we want to continue the rotation in an anti-clockwise direction, we need to make sure the force vectors are pointing in the opposite direction. To do this, we need to reverse the current direction. We need to make the current go from D to C and from B to A. The direction of the motor effect force acting on this coil depends on the direction of the current. So the question is, how do we reverse this current? This is where we introduce a very important component of all DC motors, and that is split ring commutators. Split ring commutators are two semicircular or curved components attached to the end of the armature. These two components are fixed to the armature. So as the armature rotates, the two split ring commutators will also rotate with the armature. Between the split ring commutators and the DC power supply, in this case, this is a battery, we have what we call brushes. The brushes, unlike the split ring commutators, are not connected to the armature. So as the armature rotates, the brushes will remain in the position while the split ring commutators will rotate. This is another diagram showing you what split ring commutators and brushes look like. The commutators will rotate with the armature while the brushes will remain fixed in place. If you look on the front view of this DC motor diagram, this is what you will expect to see. So when the plane of the armature is horizontal, the two semicircular commutators are also horizontal. As it rotates, you can see the orientation of the commutators will rotate in the same fashion. If we add the brushes to the picture, the brushes will remain in the same place while the commutators is rotating. This specific setup between the commutators and the brush is very important because when the armature reaches its vertical orientation, the two commutators are also vertically oriented. And when this occurs, the gap between the two commutators will be parallel to the horizontal plane and where the brushes are located. In this position, the two commutators will momentarily lose contact between the brushes. During the rotation, the commutators will remain contact with the brushes, except when it reaches this vertical orientation. When the contact between the brushes and the commutators is lost, the circuit is no longer complete, and as a result, there will be no current flowing through the coils of the armature in this instance. If we recall back to the equation for the motor effect force, which is F equals to B I L sine theta, if there's no current flowing through the coils, there will be no force. So momentarily, when the armature is in its vertical position, there's actually no forces acting on the coils. So now, as the coil continues to rotate due to momentum, the two split ring commutators will make contact with the brushes again. But this time, the contact between the two split ring commutators is different to before. The commutator on side D now makes contact with the left brush, while the commutator on side A makes contact with the right brush. This is significant because when the commutator that's connected to side D makes contact with the left brush, this will let current flow through from D to C, as the current direction has remained the same. It goes from positive terminal of the battery all the way around back to the negative terminal. But because the contact point between the two commutators and the two brushes is now switched around, the current will now travel from D to C and from B to A which is the opposite to what we had before the contact point has been switched. This is what we wanted, however. 
remember that we wanted the direction that's flowing through side CD and side AB to be reversed, such that the forces acting on the two sides is also reversed in terms of the direction. So now the force vector on side CD will be acting downwards and the force vector acting on side AB will be acting upwards. And this allows the armature to continue to rotate in the anti-clockwise direction. This is another diagrammatic comparison of what I was referring to. In the beginning, in both diagrams, current is flowing from the positive terminal to the negative terminal, going through ABCD in the first diagram and DCBA in the second diagram. If you focus on the actual letters, in the first diagram, when the commutator on side AB is in contact with the left brush, current goes from A to B and from C to D. In the second diagram, when the contact between the two commutators and the two brushes have been switched around, current is going from D to C and from B to A. So the actual direction of the whole armature has not changed, but the specific direction of current flowing through each side of the armature, that is A, B and C, D, has been reversed. In summary, the split ring commutators, as well as the brushes that go with them, are important components in DC motors. The function of split ring commutators is to reverse the current direction in each side of the coil every time the armature goes past the vertical orientation. And this occurs every half a revolution, so every 180 degrees. And we want to reverse the current direction every half a turn because we want to maintain the torque and this will allow for unidirectional and continuous rotation of the armature. Now, let's summarize all the components in the DC motor that we've discussed so far. The rotation of the armature in the DC motor is only made possible using the motor effect. The motor effect is when you have a current carrying conductor inside the magnetic field, and that conductor will be acted upon by a force due to the magnetic field. To have the motor effect, we need three things. We need the armature, which could consist of a single turn of coil or multiple turns of coil. And this is to conduct a current. We also need a DC power supply. And this is usually in the form of a battery as it will provide sufficient amounts of potential difference or voltage to generate the direct current. And the last thing here we need is a pair of magnets. And this is of course to provide the external magnetic field so that the conductor will be acted upon by a force due to the field. We have three components that work together to maintain the torque and the unidirectional rotation of the armature. We have the axle, which is the midpoint between the two sides of the coil. This is the axis about which the armature will rotate. We have the split ring commutators. The roles of these two components is to reverse the current direction going through each side of the coil every 180 degrees. And of course we do this to maintain the direction of torque and rotation. And lastly, we have the brush. The brush is also quite important as it maintains the contact point between the DC power supply and the split ring commutators. This concludes the video on DC motors.